This is the second of two lectures, or excuse me, three lectures total on uh, Derrida's The Spectres of Marx. Um, the first lecture was on Derrida and Fukuyama and Derrida's reading of Fukuyama. And before that, there was also a lecture on, on Schmidt, uh, concept of the political. And uh, we discussed Derrida's reading of Schmidt, which is also relevant to his reading of, uh, of, of Shakespeare in Inspectors of Marx. Um, and the third, the third lecture in, uh, on, on Spectres of Marx will be a lecture that will directly address Derrida's deconstruction of Marx and Marxism in a more general sense. This uh, lecture will focus on Derrida's reading of Hamlet and how he's going to promote, you know, what, I, what I'll suggest is a kind of an allegorical reading of Shakespeare's Hamlet as providing a model for a, a new politics in the aftermath, you know, of, of the fall of the Soviet Union, the demise of uh, Marxism itself as a uh, as a viable, co coherent, uh, you know, alternative, and uh, in response also to this sort of celebratory uh, uh, liberalism, which was encapsulated in uh, Fukuyama's the end, of, Francis Fukuyama's the end of history and the last man, and so. Um, Derrida is going to he's going to present he's going to give us a, a fairly provocative reading of of Shakespeare that is going to be a, a political reading itself. Um, so um, let's let's go ahead and uh, and begin. Um, here you can see here's uh, Derrida again. He lived from 1930 to 2004. Uh, if, if this is the first uh, lecture that you're listening to, you're probably better off uh, watching the Fukuyama Derrida lecture first because this one builds upon that. And then the third one, uh, the reading of, of Marx that Derrida provides, the deconstruction of Marx, um, will be, I think, more coherent after you uh, uh, listen to this particular lecture here as one builds upon the other. But in any case, as we said in the last lecture, um, Derrida gave a, a talk at the University of California, Riverside at the Wither Marxism Conference entitled Spectres of Marx, which he, over, he gave over two nights and he later elaborated into a much longer study. Now, part, part of the talk involved uh, a response to Francis Fukuyama. Part of it involved a, a deconstructive reading of Shakespeare and, and, and yet another part uh, involved his uh, deconstruction of Marx, particularly uh, Marx's capital and, and German ideology. Uh, but, but we're going to focus in this lecture on the part of Derrida's text that addresses Shakespeare's Hamlet, which uh, Freud once said was one of the three most important books, or, excuse me, works of literature ever written, along with Sophocles, Oedipus Rex, and uh, Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov, all three of them dealing with questions of this, of what, you know, the family drama or the Oedipal struggle Oedipal complex that's so central to the work of Freud. Um, you can see here uh, Shakespeare lived from 1564 to 1616. Hamlet was first uh, pr presented at the Globe Theater on 1599. There you see Lawrence of Olivier, Lawrence Olivier did a famous uh, version of this film version. It's not it, it was I think it was in 1939 that it was if uh, uh, that it, it, it appeared. Uh, it's it's a nice version. I like Olivier's version of the play. It's it's a truncated version. He doesn't present the whole play. But that I, if you're not familiar with Hamlet, you're probably better off turning this off right now or, and, and watching a, a version of Hamlet. Um, this the the one with Olivier would be. It's it's an encapsulated version. It's an abridged version, but it gives you the the essentials. And, and Derrida is going to be reading Hamlet very closely, although as I said, idiosyncratically and, and allegorically. In other words, presenting Hamlet to us as providing a kind of an allegory for political action in, in the late 20th century, early 21st century. Um, but uh, at the same time, it, it provides us with a kind of an anthropology of conjuration or, or political conspiracy. Now, in a previous lecture in the same series, um, we looked closely at Freud's totem and taboo and his Moses and monotheism, or at least part of Moses and monotheism. And, and we read that as providing a, a kind of, again, a kind of an anthropology of, of, of the first political conspiracy. 
and, and, and the replacement of what, you know, Freud calls the father horde with the brother clan. And, 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 and this is, I'm, I'm mentioning this in passing because, again, knowledge of this reading that Freud provides is, will be essential for those of you that want to read Derrida's The Politics of Friendship and understand it because his deconstruction of Schmidt, for instance, Carl Schmidt's concept of the political and the, situ the very situation of the political implies, uh, a not, or, is, or is, it, it, it's built upon a reading of Freud's Totem and Taboo. So, and, th and this text is also going to be in the backdrop of, the, of, the, of Derrida's reading of Hamlet. I'm not saying that he offers a Freudian reading of Hamlet, but what uh, Freud's re reading of, you know, what Freud's reading of the situation of conjuration has in common with uh, Derrida's reading is that in both cases, he tr the Derrida tries to reflect upon the emergence of the political as a matter of uh, conspiracy or, or oath swearing, swearing together. And, uh, and, and Freud does this a similar kind of speculative anthropological reading of conjuration in his uh, Totem and Taboo, and where, where there we see also that, uh, where, where he also has a fascinating discussion on the origin of, of name giving, which he associates with the Totem or the name of the father, which also becomes a, um, uh, is, is figured in, in, the, uh, in, in the animal substitute of the father, the animal who is a supplement to the father, who takes the place of the father uh, in, in, the, in the aftermath of the father's uh, death or killing at the hands of, of the brothers who rise up against him. So if we think about, as we, as we turn our attention to Hamlet, we think about this scene at the beginning of, of the play where the, the Horatio, Marcellus, Bernardo, um, and then Hamlet are, are all effectively, you know, conspirators who, who later they, they will swear on, on the sword on Hamlet's sword, the sword of his father, and 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 the, and it's the and it's the swearing together, the conjuring, swearing with that will that will evoke for them an image of the father. The father will appear, the dead father will appear, the living dead father will appear. You know, after he is summoned, uh, when when the conjurers gather together and and swear together um, to keep a, a secret. Uh, about what they have seen when when the when this ghostly figure appears. Now this is going to be for Derrida linked to the very um, idea of of the religious itself, which is which he's going to say is irreducible, and he's going to say that this is an important aspect of Marx's thought as well when, when he speaks of what he what he calls the irreducibility of the religious model. Uh, to ideology and 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 what he's really talking about is this same kind of primordial scene that freud is theorizing in the in totem and taboo and that derrida discusses in um in uh, the uh politics of friendship that also is is uh implied in in schmidt's discussion of of the political in the concept of the political so that we want to sort of keep these texts in the back of our mind as we're, as we're looking at Hamlet through Derrida's lens, and we'll refer to certain aspects of these texts insofar as they're relevant to the reading that Derrida proposes uh, uh, of Shakespeare's Hamlet. Okay, so let's, let's uh, start with, uh, you know, here you, can, here you can see this image provides us, you know, it says we're on the castle of Elsinore, and there is the king. He appears as a kind of a suit of armor, uh, and uh, and he is he is uh, sworn uh, by these conspirators. So the king has been killed. His brother has killed him. We learn you know later by pouring you know poison into his ears. This is not an incidental uh, fact for Derrida. And of course the the, the po poisoning runs all throughout the play. When we get to the end of the play, when uh, when when Shakespeare uh, has Hamlet you know kill. The uncle, it's you know, it's partly related to the fact that that that, that his uncle has you know has poisoned uh, him, uh, and so you know, poisoning is all you know is 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 all about you know the question of pharmacon is, is linked to the question of poisoning and the nature of the word itself as a kind of a, a, a pharmacon or me, uh, medicine, which can be both again a remedy and a cure, as we discussed uh, earlier in a reading of Plato and, and Derrida. So. Um, but the main conspirators who conjure the king in this play are Hamlet, Marcellus, and Horatio. Now, Hamlet is, of course, the prince 
who asks what Heidegger will call the question that is first in rank, to be or not to be, that is the question. It's also the opening uh, lines from uh, Heidegger's introduction to metaphysics, which he's going to link to uh, Aristotle's principle or law of non-contradiction, you know, being, non-being. And this, this is Hamlet's question, but Hamlet is also the prince who, as we're going to see in Derrida's reading, is, is, is uh, uh, unfortunately cursed to have to redress an, an injustice that has happened. And the injustice is that his uncle has killed his uh, father and married his mother, and he curses his fate. He doesn't want to, uh, uh, to, 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 to take, you know, uh, he doesn't want to even have to act at all. He finally does act. But uh, this is for Derrida, as we're going to see, emblematic of, of, in some sense, the situation of all of us insofar as we find ourselves born at, at, in a time that is indeed out of joint. When, you know, when there's so many, uh, as Derrida is going to observe, you know, problems in the world, we feel, you know, a bit like Hamlet, you know, cursed to have to redress the, the, the wrongs that, that, that are so overwhelming that we confront, you know, for instance, uh, very obvious, you know, facts of, you know, environmental catastrophe, global warming. Now we're confronting in the context of these lectures, the coronavirus. There are many other injustices as well that Derrida draws attention to inspectors of Marx. Uh, but this is the, the situation of Hamlet is, is sort of in existential terms. We're going to see is the situation of everyone who has to, um, you know, uh, set things right or who is cursed to have to set things right because, he or she has been born at a time that is out of joint. Now, uh, Marcellus, we're going to see, is is the guard. who's kind of an uneducated, naive guard, but he's 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 a uh, you know he 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 believes uh, he, he has the capacity for faith that as in Derrida's reading and and the capacity to act for action that is lacking in Horatio, who is the scholar who has difficulty believing in the reality of the specter. Who appears, and so these three figures are going to loom large in Derrida's reading, his, in his allegorical reading of uh, Hamlet. Now, now I, sh I say allegorical. I should also qualify that by saying Derrida would probably not uh, uh, appreciate my use of that, uh, of that, or that description of what he's doing. He, at some point, he does say he's he's undecided on the question of allegory, or he's ambivalent about it. Uh, because, of course, allegory is, you know, in, in, let's say, Augustinian terms is linked to a certain sort of Christian logocentric rhetoric. But allegory, allegorical forms of interpretation, you know, were, were prevalent, you know, in, um, in throughout the ancient world, including in Judaism and the Greek world, you know, long before Christianity. But he's so he's, he's a little bit cautious about uh, allegory. Uh, but in any case, what, whatever term wants to use to describe what Derrida is doing, he's he's explicitly linking uh, the situation of these three different individuals and, and the conjuring of the king to the current situation that uh, he's addressing in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, later part of the 20th century, early 21st century, and asking, what now uh, do we do, uh, given the fact that, uh, you know, we, we seem to be in a world that in, in which, you know, uh, uh, socialist alternatives to political praxis have have disappeared. Okay, so um, the uh, the the term here again, conjuration, uh, is is going to be very important uh, to this text, and we're going to see what Derrida does with this term conjuration, and he, he because he he'll, he will explicitly tell us what conjuration is and what he means by this term conjuration. You know, but but before. Uh, we look at that. I want to just, you know, briefly say this is that, you know, he's also going to draw attention to how Mark Karl Marx is going to say that theology itself is belief in ghosts. And later when we get into uh, Derrida's deconstruction of Marx, we're going to see this is going to be a very central aspect of his reading of Marx, this question of the ghost and, and, and belief in ghosts. Um, which is the, a theological question, but it's also going to be linked to the, the political as well. Now, here's, here's uh, Derrida in, uh, in Spectres of Marx. He says, the, treat, the treatment of the, uh, the phantomatic in Marx's German ideology announces or confirms the absolute privilege that Marx always grants to religion. Okay, no, note that the, the absolute privilege 
that Marx always grants to religion, to ideology as religion, mysticism or theology in his analysis of ideology in general. Okay, so this this is worth uh, you know pausing on for just a minute here because uh, you know the the sort of the standard uh, view of Marx and Marxism out there is you know is that. Uh, uh, Marxism is is uh, hostile to to religion, sees it as opium of the masses. Uh, that that full statement of Marx, however, is that is that it's the soul of the people in a soulless time, as Marx is going to say uh, as well. But uh, Marxist thought is 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 in this, is as we're going to see in, in in the way that Derrida is going to be reading him is also in, in a certain sense you know religious. But by religious, we want to be clear that we're not again talking about, like as we discussed in our distinction between, uh, you know, uh, Messianicity and Messianism, it doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, dogmatic uh, religions in terms of like, say for instance, the Abrahamic, you know, religions of the book. You know, what, what we're gonna see is that the question of the religious is more linked to the question of, 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 of you know, vow, uh, swearing vows, conjuring, swearing together, with others, oath swearing, and then being duty bound by those oaths that one swears. Now, so if we say that the religious is irreducible to uh, the, or, or it is an irreducible model for a, think, a thinking of ideology, you know, we're, we're thinking then about uh, religion as, as, as being linked to the question of oath swearing and, and vow swearing. And uh, as we discussed in previous lecture on Rousseau's uh, social contract, the question of how how and why people come together to swear oaths, form laws that will become binding upon them. This is what we're you know, talking about. Uh, uh, not uh, Marx wasn't like saying, you know, you, you don't get out of religion in the sense of, um, you know, therefore you'll go to the church or synagogue or mosque or, you know, whatever the Hindu temple. Uh, he's, he's saying, uh, you know, no, no, it's, it's linked rather to the question of, uh, of oath swearing and, 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 and conjuration as we're going to uh, explore. Okay. So, um, all right. So why? Okay. So let's, let's think about this. Um, okay. So again, uh, the privilege, the absolute privilege that Marx always grants to religion, to ideology as religion, mysticism or theology and his analysis of ideology in general. If the ghost gives its form, that is to say its body to the ideology then the ghost is the central figure of the religious, according to Marx. Okay, so let's pause for just a minute. So it is the ghost that gives form or body to the uh, ideology. Now, what, another way of saying this is, is we're, what we're going to be exploring is how the, the, what we've called spirit becomes specter. Okay, so we've talked about spirit as linked to the question of the voice, the invisible word that can be heard uh, but not seen. And we've said specter is the visible uh, word that can be uh, seen, but not heard. And so there's, there's a transformation that takes place in, insofar as spirit becomes specter. Okay. So this is, this is what we're uh, talking about when we talk about the ghost, you know, uh, assuming a palpable, you know, objective form or spirit becoming specter okay and so this then is the central figure of the religious according to marx or the mystical character of 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 the fetish okay now or the totem as as we read in our reading of uh of, of uh, freud when we talked about the totem we said that the totem is about you know naming about leaving a name leaving uh, a mark uh or or what derrida is going to call a here now if we think of you know for instance um the mark, the name being, you know, in terms of circumcision, literally being, you know, a cut onto the flesh or written into the flesh. The father writes his or inscribes his here now into the flesh of the child. Well, however one wants to conceptualize that, the 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 here now, the totem, the fetish, or we could think of, for instance, also in terms of a supplementary sense, when the animal is going to stand in for the father, take the place of the father. Uh, as well, that in both cases, it's 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 a uh, it has a it has a visible, spectral, palpable uh, quality to it. The mark is 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 a spectral uh, mark uh, inscribed literally in the in case of uh, the case of 
uh, circumcision on, on the body of, of the child. It's no longer spirit. Spirit becomes specter. Or as in, you know, in the Abrahamic tradition, the Genesis, the Genesis story, you know, circumcision is the sign of the covenant. Think of it as the visible sign of the vow. All right. So if the vow is spirit, uh, circumcision or the mark, the totem, the, the, the inscription is the spectral uh, you know, it, it, it is a matter of of the of, of spirit becoming you know specter. Okay, in the mark it leaves on the experience uh, of the religious is first of all of a ghostly character. So here's Derrida. What seems to be at stake in Marx's thought is on the one hand the irreducibly specific character of the specter, which uh, cannot be derived from a psychology of the imagination or from a, psycho, a, a psychoanalysis of the imaginary. And I'm adding, I'm, I'm adding here to this be, precisely because it is a collective psychosis. In other words, if I, if I have an hallucination and I see a specter, or I believe that I see a specter or a ghost, let's say if I believe my house is haunted and a ghost walks through, um, if, it's, if it's an individual uh, you know, experience that I have, one could talk about it in terms of, of a, some sort of individual psychological hallucination that I'm having as an individual. But if we think of the specter as being, you know, collectively, uh, you know, uh, experienced by a group of people who are swearing together, uh, then that spectral image becomes a, a matter of not just one individual having some sort of psycho psychotic breakdown. It's a, it's a collective uh, psychosis. Okay. And again, as Derrida is going to say in um, his book, Veils, in his uh, uh, silkworm, of one, uh, silkworm of One's Own, you can't, you know, you can only, you can't prove that the ghost appears. You can only swear it. And that's what is, is important to underscore here. When we think of the, the, the conjuring that happens at the beginning of this uh, text and, and, and in the beginning of Shakespeare's play, is that the ghost, you know, it, it can't be, you can't prove it, you can only swear it. And so this is a matter of, of swearing. And so this is partly, again, what we mean by, again, the religious and the irreducibility, you know, of, of the religious model, something that implies a group of people coming together and swearing together that they've seen the ghost, which would be, if, if, it, if, if the ghost were to actually appear, uh, it would be uh, an, an empirical, uh, uh, terms, it was certainly would be what Derrida calls a, an experience of, of the impossible because specter is not spirit. Uh, specter is, um, you know, something that is, uh, again, the invisible, uh, you know, word uh, for the eyes as opposed to spirit, which is, uh, you know, uh, the heard word, you know, for the ears, the spoken word for the ears, which is, which cannot be seen. So how is it then that something that is invisible can be seen. Uh, this is this is this is the, the the question that is linked to this problem of, of conjuration and uh, and the political and the and, and what Derrida is calling here the irreducibility of the religious model. Okay, so even though he says even though Marx seems to inscribe it with a socio-economic genealogy or a philosophy of labor and uh, production, and on on the other hand, and by the same token, at stake is the irreducibility of the religious model and the construction of the concept of ideology. So these are some crucial, crucial passages. And if you want to understand what Derrida is doing, not only with his reading of Shakespeare, but with his reading of Marx, it's important to really at attend to this uh, aspect of his argument that the religious model is irreducible to the concept of, of, of ideology or the, its construction. And this is not just true of Derrida, this is true of, of Marx as well, okay? So question, do we ever really get out of religion? Do we ever get out of the social you know, contract? Again, let, let's think of this etymology of the very word religion. Again, the, the word it comes from the Latin, which means again to bind, uh, binding, obligation, oath, reverence. The Middle English uh, religion means life under monastic vows. So it's all about you know, vows. It's all, religion is all about uh, oaths. Uh, and and that's that's uh, something that is worth underscoring. Okay, now in in um, in the uh, uh, specters of Marx, and you know Derrida speaks quite a lot about the Abrahamic. And I've I've addressed the question of the Abrahamic briefly in in previous lectures. Um, we can't go too far into it today, except to note that 
what what Derrida is calling the Abrahamic and the or the Abrahamic itself, which we said comes from Louis Massignon, who bar, uh, a French Orientalist who borrows it from the Islamic traditions and brings it into uh, you know in, into uh, the French uh, academic you know context, and then Derrida you know, employs this term. It, it, it's an important term in uh, inspectors of Marx. Now, obviously, it's a very uh, loaded term. I mean, it is. Um, you know, linked to the idea of, you know, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all of them tracing their, you know, let's say their their, their common uh, origin or ancestor back to being Abraham. Now, in the Christian tradition, it's Abraham is believed to be a, it's this matter of spiritual succession in um, in Islam and in, uh, you know, Judaism. There's there's literally a genealogical you know connection. For instance, Islam connects uh, Muhammad to, to Ishmael, to Abraham. In in uh, in you know Judaism, the Moses is connected to Isaac, who's connected to uh, you know to Abraham as well. So Abraham is is an important figure for all three of the Abrahamic traditions, and so it's a useful concept for Derrida to talk about this question. And so um, uh, the the question of conjuration itself and swearing covenant making, because it, it's in the book of Genesis where Abraham. Uh, you know, and God uh, form a covenant, and where we find this, you know, this passage in the book of Genesis, where um, w uh, where we're told that you know that, that circumcision is is a sign of uh, the covenant. Now, we talked about this in a previous lecture in terms of circumcision being a matter of you know the removal of the flesh, and then you know rolling it into a ring, and then the ring becomes itself sort of a circular symbol, uh, the, the foreskin that is being a circular symbol of you know the promise or the repetition, you know of of the yes, so this is one reason why um, this is this is an important uh, you know question. What what why you know covenant making is is uh, linked to this uh, doctrine of the eternal return in uh, in in the thought of uh, Derrida. Um, but uh, here the question is more really a matter of the vi the, the visible the the invisible becoming uh, you know visible. But I would know, you know, this idea of of, of the of what Derrida's calling it's a, it, the the circumcision is, is a trace of a union. Okay, now in the French uh, trait the union uh, is it 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 is clear in French and English. We would say what we would call the trait de union. We would call it a hyphen, you know, like a hyphenated name, like Judeo Christian with the hyphen in between, or Judeo Muslim with the hyphen, you know, in between. So the hyphen is what would link the Judeo to the Christian, but it's also what would 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 separate them, which would bring them apart. So the cut or the it's like the, the hyphen is like a cut, a mark, an inscription, like we saw again the image of Thoth who leaves his mark uh, into the into the wooden beak or creates the dice as kind of a mark making. So you can think of the, the inscription as a kind of a cut or a mark making. And the mark does two things. On the one hand, it links the child uh, to the father. It's the sign of the covenant that the father makes, you know, with the child. Um, and and then thereby therein grants all the rights and privileges that that are accorded to the child by virtue of having a, of the child bearing the name of the father, uh, but also uh, the 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 mark is is a separating mark as well because it it, it divides, uh, for instance, in the in the case of Isaac and Ishmael, it you know it links them together as brothers, but it also divides them. It se it separates them as well. So we could think of the. Um, uh, the, the cut as the hyphen, the trace of the union, as also a kind of a shibboleth or a kind of like a password, which um, which is, uh, you know, uh, differentiates, is, is a differentiating mark uh, as well. So it links together, but it also uh, dif differentiates. OK, so uh, let's let's think of this this Abrahamic concept of the trace of a union. Very important to the thought of the thinking of the Abrahamic and Derrida. And then you can find more about this if you're if you're interested in this. Uh, you might have a look at Derrida's uh, Acts of Religion. Uh, Gil and Andij Dujar, I think is his name, uh, does the introduction to it. Does a wonderful job of reading this, uh, giving up reading of this particular aspect of Derrida's uh, thought, um, which appears in a more abbreviated form in Spectres of Marx. But here's from the book of Genesis. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the, and I added here, visible sign of the covenant, uh, which, which I added here, the here now. This is one of the ways that Derrida is going to describe, you know, the signature 
and, and, and this is the, 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 the act of circumcision is, is an inscription that is the, the father signing the child or leaving his signature on the child or his here now on the child. Uh, between me and you, my covenant and your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people, for he has broken my covenant. Okay. So there we find it in, in the biblical tradition. I we can't say more about this today because this would require a whole nother uh, lecture in its own right. But I did want to mention this aspect of Derrida's, you know, reading of the sit scene of conjuration as well, and, and, and the inclusion of the thematic of the Abrahamic in uh, Specters of Marx. Okay, so let's let's take a look here. Now we're gonna we're gonna look at the pa at these passages more carefully in just a minute. But uh, Derrida is going to do this reading of, of the king being a thing or how the king, the dead, the living dead king who comes back becomes uh, a thing. And then this is the quote actually from Shakespeare. The king is a thing. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at that more carefully in a minute. But uh, if, you, if you were to, uh, let's just for a minute translate this into French. You could say le roi est un, un, un chose. Now, um, and, and, and you find this in other places in Derrida's work where, you, you, where you have this differentiation between the A and the A. Now, in French, A, E-S-T, is pronounced the same way as E-T, uh, A, but one, that, what, on the one hand, it means le roi, A, uh, est un chose, would be is a thing, uh, but it could also mean if you drop the S, which is not pronounced in any case, then the king is a thing. Now, this is also linked to this idea of difference in Derrida, because di difference, what he's calling difference is this, this difference between a spirit inspector or speaking and writing that we would not know without writing, because the, again, the S, since the S isn't pronounced, we wouldn't know the difference between the two unless we had writing. That's an important uh, aspect of Derrida's thought, you know, when he, uh, uh, you know, reverses the binary between speaking and writing, is that we wouldn't know in fact, what speaking was without writing. We need writing to know what speaking is. This is linked to also his deconstruction of Levi Strauss, like the idea of the, the raw and the cooked. I mean, for instance, in Levi Strauss's famous book, you don't know what a, a raw, say, vegetable is or raw fruit is um, unless you have it, uh, unless you can compare it to what it's not, which is cooked. It's the same thing with like nature and, and civilization as well. You can't know, there's no pure knowledge of nature there's no pure knowledge of, uh, you know, of, of the of the raw, you know, vegetable. One you need one to understand the other, and so difference is linked to this question of understanding, um, you know, that 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 you need writing to understand speaking, and you need speaking to understand writing. And so this is this is a wonderful example of, of difference in the thought of Derrida. But it's also it becomes more even more complex than that when one thinks about you know the fact that. When we say the king is a thing, you know, we're, we're in the realm of, of, of metaphor, right? Because we're saying, you know, effectively that A is the same thing as B. The king is the same thing as, as a thing. One is equivalent, you know, uh, to the other. Well, that's also obviously a metaphysical uh, proposition. But if we say the king and uh, a thing, then we're in the realm of, of metonymy or the question, again, of the supplement, the dangerous supplement or the stand in what can stand in for the king. And it's, and it's the totem or the cut, the name, the milha and Hebraic, the, the, the name that is the cut, that, and which also in, in Freud's totem and taboo is linked to the question of the fetish, which is a supplement or a stand in for the absent or for the dead king. All right. So we think of, we think again of how spirit becomes specter. It's linked to this question of how one becomes uh, the other. Uh, so how, how does the king become the real thing? A metaphysical thing is one question that we might ask. This would be think, the thinking of the king, uh, the, uh, this meta, more metaphysical question. How does the fetish then, on the other hand, or specter become a stand-in for the king or for the, the, we could say, another way to say this is how does specter uh, become a stand-in for spirit? Now, if we think of the inscription as linked to the question of specter, uh, spirit as the matter of, of the vow, the spoken word of the king, the, that we could say the spectral inscription, the here now, the signature, you know, of, of the father is a um, is a stand in for the spirit or the vow of the father. So we, can, we said previously that signature has the same relationship to 
contracts as vows have to covenants. And so they're linked again to this question of how spirit becomes specter. And this is this religious question, again, not in a doctrinal sense, not in terms of dogma, that, that both Marx and Derrida are, are wrestling with. Okay, so question, what is conjuration? Now, here's Derrida's own description of conjuration. He's going to say, conjuration designates two things at once. On the one hand, the conspiracy of those who promise solemnly, sometimes secretly, by swearing together an oath to struggle against a, a superior power. And I think here, very obviously, a Freud's brother clan, the excluded weaker males who cannot overcome the strong father and the father horde, who then come together and, uh, and, and, and form a conspiracy, and then in doing so, uh, rise up and slay uh, the father. Okay, so this is, um, you know, conjuration as, you know, conspiracy, political conspiracy. And he's going to say it is to this conspiracy that Hamlet appeals when he asks Horatio and Marcellus to swear, to swear upon his sword, obviously a very phallic you know, image, uh, but to swear or to swear together on the subject of the spectral apparition itself and to promise secrecy on the subject of the apparition. OK, now one, one aspect of Derrida's reading of this, which he, he omits, I think, is uh, worth uh, underscoring is he, he, he likes to talk about how the, 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 the visor, the, the, and what he calls it the visor effect of the king, um, that when, he, when the dead, living dead king appears, will be an image that no future uh, you know, production of the play will ever be able to admit. But, the, but, but in Shakespeare's very terse stage directions, we also get you know, that the, that the uh, king appears carrying a truncheon. Now, Derrida doesn't comment on this, but we could also think of, you know, uh, we have to remember that in, po in political conspiracies, the, those who are adulterers, which is to say those who break their oaths or break their vows, um, they do so at the risk of being, you know, uh, considered to be, uh, you know, treasonous. And this is, this is the essence of treason itself. Someone who uh, is, is uh, you know, vi who violates their, their oaths in the political conspiracy. And we could think, for instance, in um, the play in Hamlet, uh, we could think of the figures Rosencrantz and Gilderstern, who appear to be friends of Hamlet, but are not. And so Hamlet, you know, uh, makes, you know, through treachery, uh, ensures that they are both, you know, killed. Uh, and so um, this is uh, linked to this also, this idea that anyone that violate, I mean, that when you swear, um, the swear is, you're, you're swearing uh, with, with at, you know, if you, you're, you're, you're risking your very life if you don't uphold your oaths. It's a, it's a deadly serious matter, okay? Because also those who are caught uh, participating in the conspiracy will in any case be killed you know, by those they're conspiring against. Um, so you, they have this double injunction, this double threat hanging over their head, okay? So, all right, let's continue. Conjuration signifies, on the other hand, the magical incantation destined to evoke, and I've underlined this myself here, to bring forth with voice, okay? And then I've added here, to summon spirit, breath, wind from the abyssal coil of the throat. Again, remember, not underwritten in Derrida's uh, approach by any sort of metaphysical ground. Um, and so it's, it's, it's when the, the, the vow, the swearing is, is also akin to a kind of a magical incantation that is chanted, that, 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 that springs forth. It's a, it's, it's a matter of breath, all right, to convoke a charm or a spirit. Conjuration says in some, the appeal that causes to come forth with the voice and thus to make it come by definition what is not there at the present moment of the appeal okay so it's and it's it is the yes that one uh, utters the voice uh, does not describe uh, what it says certifies nothing its words cause something to happen so it's it's an actually a kind of a, a, an event that uh, occurs in the speaking of of the vow and the uttering of the yes, which is a matter again of wind, breath, blowing forth, you know, from the lungs when one says yes to the conspiracy. Okay, now here is uh, a way, one way to think about this, uh, what we're talking about. Now, if, if we think about in the uh, in the context of the uh, 
Catholic Church. Well, this is one. I'm. I'm. This is not in Derrida's text, but I'm throwing this out as that I maybe is a helpful helpful way to uh, think about this. Is that in the in the Christian tradition you have the doctrine of transubstantiation, which is embraced by the Catholic Church, not embraced by the Protestant uh, Church. So this is why, for instance, in um, in uh, you know in Protestant churches they'll have communion uh, once every you know month or so. Uh, whereas in the Catholic tradition, uh, Eucharist communion is celebrated every single time Mass is given. But, uh, and so the Protestant tradition will say when, when one uh, partakes of the elements, when one eats the bread, drinks the wine, or in, in really strict Protestant traditions, you, you make it grape, sure it's grapefruit juice, wouldn't want to you know, be drinking, caught drinking wine, uh, that, um, uh, that those elements are... Uh, uh, you know, merely a token of, of remembrance of, of Christ in, in the Protestant tradition. But in the Catholic tradition, when the priest consecrates the elements, the common elements become, you know, transformed or transubstantiated into literally the body and the blood of Christ. In, uh, in Joyce's wonderful book, you know, The Dead, you know, he claimed that this is what he was trying to do in his books, to take the dirty, gritty, everyday common elements of Dublin and, and, and like a priest consecrating the elements of Mass to to uh, you know, transform them into something you know uh, that that is akin to like what, he, what he's going to call the epiphany, which is linked to the apparition of the divine. And epiphany is when again the God uh, appears. Uh, in this case, in the actual elements. And so it's it's when the priest utters these words, hoc est corpus, that the um, that the elements are said to be uh, transubstantiated. And I'll give you one uh, funny example of this. There's not far from where I live. Uh, there's a Catholic school uh, at the, linked to the Church of the, the Assumption. We, uh, some friends of, uh, of mine, were were telling me that they had a kid. Their their kid went to that school, and one day when he was doing mass, instead of when he got the consecrated element, instead of uh, you know eating it, he just took it, put it in his pocket, ran out the playground, and was you know waving it around, and he and they almost got expelled from school. It's a very serious matter. Uh, because of course, the this is why also the priest will drink all of the wine after it's been consecrated, and then will return the elements to this you know box that has the you know the symbol the chi in the row the symbol of, of, of Christ on it. It's usually a kind of a gold box that's uh, there at, near the altar, um, and so um, that's it's 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 a belief that something happens, something you know there's a transformation that takes place in the consecration of the elements, and that's very similar to the idea that we're talking about here in terms of thinking of the irreducibility of the religious model is because there's a transformation that takes place. Now, those gathered together in the context of, of, of this congregation, you know, believe that, that Christ is actually present at that moment. And about the, the choir boy will ring a bell, uh, and it's, it's an important moment. Now, do, do they actually see an apparition of, of the divine? Uh, do they see the historical person of, of Jesus? Well, you can't empirically they can only swear they can only you know uh, uh, affirm their belief they can't you, it's not a matter that can be uh, empirically um, you know uh, verified and so when we look, look if we look here at this image here we can see uh, on the one hand you have the priest consecrating the elements on the other you have a, a, a magician pulling a rabbit out of the hat this very word hocus pocus was a uh, came etymologically came out of a kind of a you know, a, a Protestant making, you know, Protestant tradition that made fun of this idea of hoc est corpus, you know. So it's a, it's a uh, etymologically hocus pocus comes from hoc est corpus. And it's akin to like hocus pocus, pull a rabbit out of a hat, making, make a body appear that wasn't there. Okay. So, um, you know, whatever your personal beliefs are, I hope that these ideas are helpful in terms of understanding you know, what Derrida and Marx are both talking about when they speak of the irreducibility of the religious model or spirit becoming specter, or when we're talking about the apparition of a, uh, of a body that wasn't there, that, that uh, can only be believed, that can't be empirically verified, that's conjured into being by the, cons the conspirators, okay? So here, now here's another way of thinking about this. Here's some of my favorite uh, blues men. Uh, we can think of the the, the word the the, uh, the the word the blues itself. You know what are the blues? All right. Well, I mean you can see there's Miles Davis, Johnny Lee Hooker, and Ali Farkature, a Malian blues man. 
Um, and uh, when we think of like, well, how is, is music, how, you know, music is a sound that for your ears, blues are a sight that you see with your eyes. So how is it that a sound, hearing a sound can make you see a color? And this is called you know, synesthesia. This is what, this is also akin to what we're talking about, which is a condition that happens when a sense such as sight triggers another sense like smell at the same time, or when, for instance, uh, you know, something that is seen uh, becomes, you know, enables you to, to uh, something that you hear enables you to see something, in this case, you know, the voice. Right now, like in, uh, in, in, in many, uh, uh, let's say, Sufi traditions in West Africa, Sufi prayer involves, you know, chanting in uh, people come together and they chant. And sometimes the, the belief is, is that they will, that, that, the, that the name of the person whom they chant will evoke an image uh, of that person. Who, who will appear before those who uh, who are chanting together collectively the name of the person who is absent. Okay, so that's a very, if that idea is seems strange to you, it's it's, it's a very common idea in, let's say, in, in Northwest Africa, um, and uh, where like last uh, winter, I took a group of 15 uh, students and we heard everywhere we went, you know, we heard the Sufi chanting outside the places where we uh, where we stayed, but it's 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 a very ancient uh, practice. It goes back to the Gnostic tradition as well. I mean, for for instance, among among the Gnostics, um, uh, you know, the uh, if you have the, in, in in the Christian tradition, Jesus will say, "When two or three are gathered together in my name, I am I am present among them." And so, in the Gnostic tradition, which later was deemed heretical um, by the established you know ecclesiastical authorities of in Rome. Uh, that uh, in, in, in this uh, case, you know, uh, the belief was that you could, like, let's say you come together and you, you, you chant the name of Jesus, you evoke an apparition of, of Jesus. And this, uh, you know, Elaine Pagels discusses this in her Gnostic Gospels, wonderful uh, book, uh, you know, uh, that, that this was a threat to the, uh, to the uh, church authorities. Because what would happen, let's, let's say, if, if Jesus appeared and then he began to actually issue a uh, new directives. Uh, so the, there's this doctrine of the ascension that develops. So Jesus ascends, he goes into heaven, he's at the, seated at the right hand of the Father. There are no more uh, uh, spectral apparitions, and, and Gnosticism comes to be seen as a heresy. In the case of uh, Islamic you know, Sufism in West Africa, it's still a very uh, common practice. So it's, it's, it's a very ancient question, um, and it's, it's a fascinating question, one that's worth you know, thinking about. Um, okay, uh, so we, I'm going to return here briefly to something that we talked about in our reading of Heidegger uh, when Heidegger was uh, deconstructing or not, you know, was, was uh, um, you know, criticizing, in effect, the, the thought of Nietzsche from Twilight of the Idols in his introduction to metaphysics. This, this statement that Nietzsche makes when he called being itself a kind of a wisp of a vapor, evaporating, uh, evaporating reality. Um, Heidegger was very disturbed by this, but let's let's look at what he says. He says, Heidegger says, the word being in, in Nietzsche is finally just an empty word. It means nothing actual, tangible, real. Its meaning is an unreal vapor in Nietzsche's thought. Uh, you know, when, when Nietzsche says, you know, the is, or the thing in itself is not the least worth striving for, away with this question of being. We don't need to talk about it. It's just a word. Being is just a word that I speak. It's a vapor expectorated from uh, the mouth. Uh, and so Heidegger says, so in the end, Nietzsche is entirely right when he calls the highest concepts, such as being the final wisp of evaporating, evaporating reality. Who would want to chase after such a vapor, the term for which is just the name for a huge error? Now, Heidegger is being ironic here because he himself is going to say that the, that the fate of the entire world is going to hinge upon the vapor. So we think, well, what is the vapor? It's, the, it's spirit. It's, it's the spoken word that that issues from the throat again so the, the the for heidegger the fate of the entire universe hinges on this uh this little uh, wispy uh, spirit that i literally spit out of my mouth okay now think about this when you're thinking of derrida's affirmation of of the yes in in nietzsche and, and in joyce of what of this theme of the yes in derrida's work which is linked again to this question of the trace now i'm taking this quote from his structure sign and free play in the humanities, this, this talk that he gave at Johns Hopkins that was so shocking, that was so upsetting to, to uh, Levi Strauss, 
because it involved a deconstruction of Levi Strauss. But here's here's a very revealing passage from this or early text in the in the mid '60s from Derrida. He says the Nietzschean affirmation. Okay, and again, here's I'm, and I'm adding here of the absence of the center of the circle that asks the question that is first in rank, uh, das sein, or what we talked about in another lecture on ear of the others, the intact kernel. As Derrida says in his uh, critique of Heidegger, that is, for instance, for Heidegger, das sein is a is is the being that questions, but this implies a center to this to the hermeneutic circle of questioning, which is precisely what Derrida is is uh, deconstructing. This is important difference between Derrida and Heidegger. Uh, but okay, so the Nietzschean affirmation, the yes, is the joyous affirmation of a world without signs. Uh, excuse me, of a world of signs without faults, without truth, without origin. This affirmation determines the non-center otherwise than as the loss of the center. So there's not a, there's no nostalgic mourning of the loss of the center in Derrida and in Nietzsche. Um, and it plays the game with, without security. For there is a sure free play, that which is limited to the substitution of giving and existing present pieces. In absolute chance, affirmation also surrenders itself to genetic indetermination, to the seminal adventure of the trace. Okay, now I can't spend too much time reading this, unpacking this, because we want to stay focused on specters of Marx, but I would note here again is that this question of, of the trace is as this empirical external, uh, you know, um, Vapor, if you want to put it in Nietzschean terms, that is that is not on the inside of me, not in inside what you know. Derrida is going to call the small container of the human head, but is but but circulates outside me, uh, in 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 the uh, we could say in the empirical external realm. And so the trace is the, again this this um, the smallest, most irreducible, uh, you know, unit that 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 is irreducible in the sense that it can't it cannot be uh, deconstructed in the sense that it's there. It's not. In other words. The vapor uh, may be just a vapor, but it's not nothing. Uh, to put it in you know terms of our basic concepts of metaphysics, it's we can think of nothing as Cora and Derrida, but also as uh, um, difference. But but if 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 the vapor is just a vapor, if it's just a wind, if it's just spirit, um, if it's just some sort of inscription, to put it in spectral terms uh, on on the exterior. Uh, and, and that's all it is, and it's not underwritten by any metaphysical ground. It's still not nothing. It's still something, okay? And so, so deconstruction is, is, is a matter of sort of this adventures, following the adventures of this trace uh, that, uh, let's say, or of the vapor, to put it in Nietzsche in terms of the yes, that circulates in, in, the, uh, in the external world. And as we're going to see, he's going to say the yes, um, which is, you know, which is a condition of its intelligibility is that it's iterable. It must be uh, repeated. So it's also a kind of, as we're going to see, a revenant. It begins by coming back. Uh, and this is also why Derrida is going to link it to the idea, you know, of, of, of the, uh, you know, it's, it's living, but it's also like a dead, you know, revenant that has uh, returned. Okay. All right. So let's, let's focus though, uh, for now on specters of uh, Marx, and then we're going to, uh, we'll, we'll return to some of these questions also when we do, when we look at Derrida's reading of Marx. So here's Derrida. In, in terms of this question of conjuring the king thing or the res, uh, conjuring the dead king, the living dead king who appears before the three conspirators of Hamlet, uh, Marcellus, and Horatio. According to Marx, the specter is a paradoxical incorporation, a uh, spirit becoming specter, the becoming body, a certain phenomenal and carnal form of spirit. It becomes something that remains difficult to name, neither soul nor body, and both one and the other, for it is flesh and phenomenality that give to the spirit its uh, spectral apparition. All right, so uh, yeah, um, for instance, Horatio, as we're going to see, is the scholar who writes, and so you need, uh, you do need flesh, uh, the fleshly, uh, you know, creatures to give uh, spirit its spectral apparition. Uh, let's say to inscribe, uh, for instance, the case of Horatio. Uh, the spirit and specter are not the same thing, but as for what they have in common, one does not know what it is, what it is presently. It is something that one does not know precisely, and one does not know if precisely it is, if it exists, uh, if it responds to a name and corresponds to an essence. 
One does not know if it is living or if it is dead. One does not, excuse me, nor does one see in flesh and blood this thing that is not a thing, this thing that is invisible between its apparition, uh, apparitions when it reappears. This thing looks at us like the dead king looking at Hamlet uh, and sees us uh, not see it even when it is there. We call this the visor effect. We do not see who looks at us. Even though in his ghost, the king looks like himself, that does not prevent him from looking without being seen. His apparition makes him appear still invisible beneath his armor. Okay, now let's, let's uh, note here that, you know, we're talking about the conjuration of the, uh, of, of the dead king, but the relation to this conjured image is uh, not much different from our relation to actual others who are every bit other from us, as, as we've already seen in Derrida's reading of ethics, because we don't like, you know, we don't know who, uh, who looks uh, at us and they don't know, you know, they can't see our, you know, irreducible essence if there is such a thing uh, either. And so we both of us see without being seen. And so this, this, the relationship between the king uh, who 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 was conjured and our relationship to actual others is is not much is not very different and so in both cases it's, they're they're governed by this what he's calling here the visor effect which we said the opening and shutting you know of the eyes remember we also link the visor effect to the question of of, of uh, compassion the question of you know uh, of, of of seeing the other through eyes that are wet with uh, compassion, you know, teary compassion, okay, you know, for, for the other. Now think of this in, in comparison to the Cartesian idea of seeing the external form with absolute clarity, which is what, you know, uncertainty, which is what, you know, uh, Descartes was, was all about. Well, again, as we said, you know, previously in, in seeing the other, do we always, you know, want to see the other with this sort of, you know, insight, insect-like, you know, uh, clarity? Or is it important that we look at the other through eyes that are, uh, you know, compassionate? And this is also one of the reasons why Derrida is going, going to, unlike, you know, Heidegger, who he's going to sort of, you know, criticize this because Heidegger himself is, is describes, you know, the Greeks as I people. And he's also a kind of an I person himself. And Derrida is going to, going to in contrast, emphasize the question of, of blindness, you know, of, of not seeing that sometimes it's, it's, it's good to not see, which is why we also, why we lower uh, the the uh, the visor as well. Let me just give you one quick example. For instance, in the Islamic tradition, which I think is also relevant here, as part of the Hajj to Mecca, um, there's an important rite that everybody performs. It's called the rite of say, which is like the uh, one reenacts the desperate search of Hajar for um, uh, for water. Because in, in the story, in the biblical story, you know, Abraham is told by God to take Hagar and Ishmael, leave them out in the desert. When he leaves them with a little water and a few figs, uh, but when when the water and the figs uh, dry up uh, and, and there's no longer any anything left to eat or to drink, you know, Hagar she's, she's running around looking for uh, something to save her child, and she starts to weep. And it's at that moment when she weeps that she sees the angel standing at the feet of her son, you know, Ishmael. And then there's a well that, you know, is, is coming up from the ground. This is the well of Zamzam. And then a city is formed around this well, which is the city of, you know, Mecca. So this idea of, you know, you, the, only the eyes that can, only, only the eyes that are, you know, wet with compassion, only the eye of water is another way to say this, can see water, can see, can see the source of life. So this is in Islamic theology as well. So all the pilgrims, you know, run around, uh, you know, Mecca, you know, look, you know, reenacting this desperate search for water. But it's about, you know, seeing with compassion, like as opposed to like seeing with the evil eye, which is the eye of ice that can't reach, you know, the heart. And so this, this, is, a, uh, this is a theme that is not just in Derrida's work, but we find it in Northern Africa in a more general sense and throughout the uh, Islamic world in general. Um, so, okay, and it, and it goes back even further than that to the uh, ancient, you know, Egypto-African world, like, you know, Horus, the, the idea, or the idea that, you know, the, the God created, the, the world is created from the tears of God. Okay, so in any case, um, the one who says, I am my, thy father's spirit, Derrida says, you know, can only be taken at his word, who claims to hold, this is the one who would claim to hold the scepter to wield the logo. So if someone says to you, for instance, I, you know, I am, you know, the truth, I am speaking the truth, 
you can only believe it. You can't know it. You can't, you know, you, you, you can only believe it. You can't, uh, uh, because we don't see the, the metaphysical grounds. If this, again, if the truth were to disclose itself in these, in these terms, um, you know, it would certainly be a very, uh, you know, spectacular uh, event. Uh, and so, uh, you know, um, you know, that would be a, a, a logocentric thinking that Derrida is, uh, is, is deconstructing here. So he says, an essentially blind submission to his secret, to the secret of his origin. This is a first obedience to the injunction. It will condition all others. This armor, the armor that the king is wearing, this costume, which no stage production will ever be able to leave out, we see it cover from head to foot in Hamlet's eyes, the supposed body of the father. Uh, we do not know whether it is or is not part of the spectral apparition. The projection is rigorously problematic, and the problema here is also, uh, he tells us, a kind of a shield. All right. So we think of the armor as, you know, the, the, the appearance of the other, you know, what we see when we look at the other. Now, um, for Derrida, he's going to say, look, the specter is anything but mere appearance. It's not just uh, an appearance. Uh, but there is something that that does that we do, uh, you know, observe. But what is be, what is beyond that, or what is behind that, we don't really know. And so if we think of like you know the coat of arms, shield. We can think of you know problematics. These are all you know um, external uh, images that we we perceive. But we do, but the name, the the the, the proper name, uh, although it's irreducibly linked to the person who. Uh, who, who it's connected to, you know, again, there's, there's this, for Derrida, there's this gap or this disjuncture between, you know, let's say who that person is in sort of any metaphysical sense and, and the name uh, that, that they, uh, that they bear. Okay, so there you can see the, the, uh, the, in the middle is the shield of Achilles, famous, you know, shield. Uh, and then you see the, the coat of arms of both Marx and uh, Hegel there. Okay. So the king, the king who is uh, conjured, is we've said a kind of a it's it's a res publica it's the king thing the public thing uh, it is a thing uh, that is uh, again a kind of an artificial thing not created by God created by man uh, and it is uh, public because it involves you know it, it only comes into being when all of the different members of the body politic swear together and what they bring into being as we've said previously is a kind of the beastly uh, sovereign. Uh, you know, figure, which is what we mean when we talk about the republic or the res public or the public thing, the king thing, which is which is always a matter of conjuration and conspiracy. Okay, here's a uh, Hobbes in uh, the Leviathan when he's talking about this sovereign beast that we summon in our conjuring uh, uh, art. Uh, and a note to conjuration, if you look at the first theorists of sovereignty, they, many of them, like Boudin, for instance, were totally interested in demonology. And it was sovereign. The, the question of uh, sovereignty itself was, was from the very beginning in the early uh, European tradition was, was, was linked to the question of sorcery, demonology and conjuration because it is it's, it, they have a common sort of uh, origin. Uh, by art is is uh, created that great leviathan called a commonwealth or state in latin civitas which is but an artificial man though of greater stature and strength than the natural man for whose protection and defense it was intended and in which the sovereignty is an artificial soul as giving life and motion to the whole body all right so this is an interesting problem is that this, so if the sovereign is a prosthetic, you know, machine, in effect, that is not created by God, but created by humans, like the humans might create, you know, robot or computer, uh, the soul, like, what is the soul of a computer? Uh, no matter how well a computer can compute, do, do, do we think of a computer as having, you know, a soul in any sort of metaphysical sense? Well, we could ask the same question of, of the sovereign that we conjure into being is, is, where does the soul of this sovereign, you know, beast uh, reside? given the fact that it is a mere, you know, robotic, you know, machine that we've created. Okay, so here's Derrida's gloss on Hobbes. He says, if sovereignty as artificial animal or as beast, and you know, in the French, la bête, as prosthetic monstrosity, as Leviathan uh, is a human artifact, if it is not natural, it is deconstructible. It is historical and as historical subject to infinite transformation. It, it is at once precarious, mortal, 
and perfectible. Now, th this I think this is a really uh, important point because this implies again, you know, this this notion that, you know, um, as we saw in our discussion of, of, of Fukuyama, that you know that when we take let's say the ideal of uh, the liberal democratic as Fukuyama does and say, well, it's per it's it's perfectly the, the concept is perfectly articulated. There's nothing more that we can add to it. You know, it's it's uh, it's the uh, we've already discovered the ideal to which we need to uh, for which we need to strive. Uh, you know, here's Derrida saying, well, no, let's 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 rethink this um, because uh, you know if 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 the if, if the if, if the Leviathan, if the Republic, if the thing that we uh, bring into being is something of our own creation, in effect, then it is it is vulnerable to deconstruction and it can be made better, just as any machine can be made better. You know, we, we always are getting upgrades in our computers. You know, sometimes they frustrate us, but do we think they're going to stop anytime soon? You know, probably not. Uh, and the same is true of, of the, uh, you know, the republic that we conjure uh, into being. And so republics are... Uh, can and should be deconstructed. This is this is the point that he's uh, making here. Okay, so all right. So here's here's Derrida. Uh, now he's this is from Specters of Marx when he's discussing this king thing that the conjurer summer and summons the being. He says the king is a thing. Thing is the king precisely where he separates from his body, which however does not leave him. Okay. Now here's the quote from Shakespeare that he's uh, explicating. The body is with the king. But the king is not with the body. The king is a thing. Okay, so I think we you know we talked about the difference between the A and the A or the and and the is in French. And this might be a helpful sort of way to think about what's going on here in these passages. If we think if we think of the king like metaphor A equals B, we can think of the king is a uh, is is the is a thing in this metaphorical thinking. But you know metaphors are poetic images. Like for instance, when Plato says the soul is like an oyster in an oyster shell. Um, we know that's a metaphor when he says logos is, um, you know, a seed that God, that the God's place in the marrow. This is metaphorically speaking because he's speaking about something that is finally, you know, transcendental. Um, but we have, you know, we have to have recourse uh, to metaphor. But but metaphorical thinking, by definition, conflates two things that aren't the same together and says that they're the same. All right. Uh, and so. Um, Metaphor, the metaphor then is that we say the king is a thing that's metaphysical, but it's also metaphorical. All right. So metonymy, by uh, contrast, is when we say that it's a matter of, again, the dangerous supplement or the supplement that the king, we add the thing to the king. We can think of, for instance, the totem, which is the name, the king and the totem or the stand in for the king. It could also be the, uh, the you know, the, the animal that is you know, sacrificed in Freud's reading what the, the figure of, of the king, the mark of the king. Uh, in this case, the king is no longer with his body because the king is dead. So the totem has to stand in for the king. So we can think of the armor again as being the coat of arms, the name, the problema, the shield is, is a kind of a stand in for the king because the king is not with uh, his body. Okay. All right. So uh, now um, I'm gonna let's. I want to go a little bit more deeply into what Derrida calls the three things of the thing, which are linked to these three figures: Hamlet, Horatio, Marcellus. Now, if you look at the subtitle of Derrida's book, it's entitled "Specters of Marx," but it has this subtitle, which is "The State of the Debt, the Work of Mourning, and the New International." And I think in the new version that they uh, they, they issued uh, Rutledge issued a re-edition of this. I think unfortunately they left the subtitle off the. Uh, off, off the cover of the book, but I think you really need the subtitles to understand what is going on here in this text and what these three uh, th uh, sub themes are and why they're important. Um, because we're going to see that Derrida is going to link, you know, the figure of Hamlet to what he's calling the state of the debt. He's going to link the figure of Horatio to what he's calling the work of mourning, and he's going to link the figure of Marcellus to what he's calling the new. International. And these are again. These are these three conjurers are the three things of the thing. And so, as he uh, goes more deeply into his reading of Shakespeare, he's going to uh, apply them to the, the, these figures to the current, you know, world situation. So let's let's take a, uh, let's take a little bit of time and unpack this. So, what are the three things of the thing? Now, in the case of the Horatio complex, or we can think. Remember, the complex is also a problematic, a problema, a shield. Uh, but in the case of this complex, Derrida says, first of all, there is mourning. We will be speaking of nothing else. It consists always in attempting to ontologize remains, 
to make them present in the first place by identifying the bodily remains and by localizing the dead. All ontologization, all uh, semantization, philosophical, hermeneutical, or psychoanalytical finds itself caught up in this work of mourning, but as such, it does not think it. Okay, so let's just briefly unpack this. We can say ontologizing remains. What are we talking about here? Identifying bodily remains, uh, localizing the dead. Okay, now let's think here again of the, the, the specter as, as in, in terms of the question of the dead, the dead letter, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the scholar, like Horatio, you know, is a scholar. What does that mean? It means, well, he reads. And what does he read? He reads, you know, Latin. He reads dead, uh, a, a language that is now dead anyway, uh, except in some, you know, church contexts. Um, but he, you know, he, he is a reader of, of words that, uh, and, and so it is his task, in effect, to ontologize remains or to take, let's say, you know, specters, excuse me, spirits, and transform them into specters. In effect, he writes, and he not, not only does he write, he reads, and he he's, he's he's performing the work of mourning because he is uh, he's occupied, you know, with the dead. Okay, think for instance, like we're looking at a screen here now. These are dead letters. Uh, we're giving them spirit. And this is, you know, we're, we're, we're explicating the text. We're performing a close reading of the text. We are, we, we are following in the steps today of Horatio because we are doing the work of mourning, uh, the, the same kind of work that Horatio does. And so this is an important complex or problematic for Derrida. Another way to say this is this is, this is the, the theme of the intellectual, the theme of, of the thinker. Uh, and so if we think about, you know, revolution, like what is a revolution? How do conspiracies come into being that, that change the order such as it is given to us? One of the key figures in any revolutionary praxis, Derrida is pointing out here, is, is our intellectuals, people who do, as Horatio does, the work of mourning. And then there's what he's calling the Hamlet complex or the Hamlet problematic. You know, so he says, Derrida says, next, one cannot speak of the generation of skulls, uh, Kant qui uh, Jean-Louis Hegel qui Jean-Louis Marx. This is Kant who beget Hegel, who beget Marx, except on the condition of language, okay, which I note here, issues from the maternal living mother, the mother tongue, hence the maternal debt and or uh, the state of the debt. Uh, and the voice, in any case, of that which marks the name or takes its place. Hamlet, as he says, that skull of York had a tongue in it and could sing once. Okay, so, so very uh, quickly here, let me say this. Um, uh, Derrida says at a later point in Spectres of Marx that all revolution has to pass through the maternal. Well, this is linked to this idea that we discussed in a, in a previous lecture when we talked about um, in, in Ear of the Other, and we talked you know, about this Nietzschean statement that I am my uh, dead father and my living mother. I am the two. They're both me. And we, we discussed how, you know, the, the, the educational institutions today do violence to, uh, to, to the living mother or to, to the spirit or to the mother tongue. Right? And, the, and, the, and the state wants us to both think it's both father and, and mother at the same time. You know, again, in this formulation, uh, Nietzsche is not renouncing the dead father, but he's saying you know, he's, he's concerned about the neglect of the living maternal, which is to say, you know, spirit or the mother tongue. OK, so uh, it's both. It's living mother and uh, dead father at the same time. And so Derrida is going to say that, you know, is that, you know, Hamlet as the mother of, of the queen. You know, and, and one of the important themes in, in the play is, is the figure of, you know, of, of, the, of Hamlet's mother and his problematic relation to her since she so quickly married the uh, uh, you know, her, his uncle. But, but this idea is that, is that, you know, is that if there's going to be a revolution, not only do you need intellectuals like, uh, you know, uh, Horatio, you need someone like, you know, uh, Hamlet who's going to give spirit to the revolution by passing through the living maternal. All right. And this is also a matter of blood. I think this is kind of one aspect of Derrida's thought that there's, there's, you know, difficult to 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 reflect upon i i don't really i mean i don't want i can't i don't want to get too far into it today except to say you know historically you know republican thought has been um hostile to uh the thought of thinking of nobility and aristocracy i mean if you read the declaration of independence it's essentially a rant against you know king george 
Um, and, and, and I don't think, I think that in Derrida's thinking of nobility, there's, there's, he, there's, there's a, it's interesting when he leaves undeconstructed. And I think it might also be linked to the question of his, uh, you know, support of, of Zionism. Uh, but in any case, uh, putting that aside for now, um, l- let's say, you know, and, and, and as we want to read, you know, Derrida in terms of uh, how he would want to be read or how he, what he's perhaps trying to say here is um, that you need like, for instance, uh, you know, uh, Whit- Whitman, you know, uh, in, in the American uh, tradition, you know, Whitman is, is the American poet that Emerson, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, summoned forth when he said, you know, we need poets that don't write like England, poets from England, but that write like American poets so that there's an authentic American spirit. And so, you know, Whitman was the inauguration of, of, a, of a really profound American poetic tradition, I think, that extends through figures like William Carlos Williams and Allen Ginsberg and uh, Bob Dylan, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, the, uh, the blowing in the wind guy. Uh, it's all about, you know, spirit is all about wind. And so you need the, the revolution needs that kind of spiritual impetus as as well. Uh, and certainly Ginsburg was, was a kind of a revolutionary figure in his own right. And so was, uh, 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 I mean, with, through Ginsburg, we get, you know, legalization of, of marijuana. We get, uh, 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 you know, uh, gay liberation. I mean, Ginsburg was, you know, was, was an activist uh, in, in, on, on American campuses that, that militated for these uh, uh, revolutionary changes in American society, in addition to uh, militating against the uh, Vietnam War. And at that night, I, I pull this as an example of what Derrida is talking about, returning to the living mother. And so we can think of Ginsburg as a kind of, the, the revolution needs Horatio, the scholar, but it also needs, you know, Ginsburg, the poet. It's one, one way of thinking about it. Okay. Um, all right. The Marcellus complex or problematic. All right. So now Marcellus is the armed soldier, right? And so this is the mil- he's the militant figure. Uh, and here's uh, Derrida's reading of this problematic. He says, finally, Marx, qui uh, jean louis Paul Valéry, Marx, uh, who begat Paul Valéry, uh, and, and, and uh, the thing works, he says, praxis, in other words, um, whether it transforms or transforms itself, poses or decomposes itself, the spirit, the spirit of the spirit is work. But what is work? What is its concept if it supposes the spirit of the spirit? Valerie underscores it. Uh, by spirit here, I mean a certain power of transformation. He's quoting Valerie. The spirit works. Okay. Um, and so this, and so Derrida is going to associate Marcellus with praxis, uh, with, with what, is, what he's calling the new international. Okay. So um, Marcellus is, is, is the figure of, of praxis. Okay. And he's also not coincidentally a militant figure as, as well. And so he's not, you know, he's not as learned as, um, as, uh, you know, Horatio, he doesn't have, he's not a nobleman in the way that, uh, uh, Hamlet is, but he is the one that puts it into action. He's the one who says to Horatio, thou art a scholar, Horatio, speak to it. So he's the one who prods, uh, us into action and to work. And so these three, figures are uh, the Marcellus being a figure of, of praxis of this new international I was going to say they're all essential to uh, 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 this revolutionary praxis that Derrida is describing here okay all right so let's we're going to now I'm going to go just a little deeper into each of these complexes so we understand them uh, and, and as Derrida articulates them so Derrida in terms of the Horatio complex what he's called you know doing performing the work of mourning he says one does not if the thing conjured is living or dead, uh, one does not know, excuse me, if the thing conjured is living or dead. And Marcellus, you know, he's quoting Marcellus here from Shakespeare's play. What has this thing appeared again tonight? And Bernardo, who doesn't, uh, you know, partake of this conspiracy, says, I've seen nothing. Uh, the thing is still invisible. Uh, it is nothing visible. I have seen nothing, we're told. At the moment one speaks of it, and in order to ask oneself if it has reappeared, it is still nothing that can be seen when one speaks of it. It is no longer anything that can be seen when Marcellus speaks of it, but it has been seen twice. And it is in order to adjust speech to sight that Horatio the skeptic has been convoked. Okay, so that's his job to adjust 
speech to sight. He is a scholar after all. He is a writer and a reader. The last one to whom a specter can appear, address itself, or pay attention is a spectator as such, theater, whether we're talking about theater or school. Uh, the reasons for this are essential, Derrida says. As theoreticians or witnesses, spectators, observers, and intellectuals, scholars believe that looking is sufficient, right? They're somewhat scopophilic. Uh, silently reading dead letters. Therefore, they are not always in the most competent position to do what is necessary, to speak to the specter. Herein lies an indelible lesson for Marxism. There is no longer, there has never been a scholar who really, and as a scholar, deals with ghosts. A traditional scholar does not believe in ghosts, nor in all that could be called the virtual space of spectrality. There has never been a scholar who, as such, does not believe in the sharp metaphysical distinction between the real and the unreal, the actual and the inactual, the living and the non-living, the being and the non-being, to be or not to be. Again, so when Marcellus urges uh, Horatio, the, sp uh, the scholar, to speak to the specter, uh, Marcellus was perhaps not in a situation to understand that a classical scholar, for instance, of Latin, dead letters, would not be able to speak to the ghost. Marcellus appeals to the scholar Horatio or to the learned intellectual to whom the man, to the man of culture as a spectator who better understands how to establish the necessary distance or how to find the appropriate words for observing. Marcellus does not ask Horatio merely to speak to the ghost, but to call it, to interpolate it, to interrogate it, more precisely to question the thing that it still is, okay? So, so I wanna just note here very briefly, so what, what he's really saying here, I think, is that um, scholars are, uh, you know, because they're so, you know, into living their heads and they are so focused on texts um, that they, that, that sometimes they're not, you know, they're, they're, they can be too skeptical. They can, they can be standoffish. They want to just sort of observe from a distance. And, um, and so as such, you know, they just kind of stand back with their arms, you know, folded and they, uh, you know, yeah, we'll see, you know, and, and, and they're not, you know, they're, 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 they need to be goaded into praxis. They need to be goaded. They need to get off their butts and, 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 do, and, and, and do something more than just be a spectator. You know, like in the uh, Euripides play, uh, uh, the Bacchae, when, you know, Pentheus goes up into the tree and he just wants to watch, you know. Um, sp uh, scholars shouldn't uh, just want to watch. They should also... Uh, uh, be willing to uh, to act, and so uh, you know Marcellus, who's not as educated, and in effect, his lack of education, his lack of book learning, is is in this sense a kind of an advantage to him. And so there's also a sense in which Horatio needs Marcellus uh, to uh, to goad him into action. So Marcellus depends upon Horatio. Horatio depends upon Marcellus. Now, if you read the writing in the Frankfurt School. Uh, and Derrida uh, won the Adorno Award one year, and so the, the Frankfurt School uh, did see some uh, relevance in his uh, work. Um, you know, the, 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 Adorno, the, the Frankfurt School theorists often discuss this in terms of, you know, how do you mediate between, you know, the, in, the, between the uh, intelligentsia, the educated elite class, and the, um, uh, and, and the working class, that there's always this sort of disconnect between the two. If you think of the example, say, of surrealism, uh, for the for the surrealist, you know, the Breton uh, the, and, and so on, and the under Breton, you know, thought that he was a Marxist. Um, the the Marxists in the Soviet Union didn't think they thought he was sort of a petty bourgeois who was you know playing around with ideas. And certainly the 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 uh, the, the, the masses weren't particularly interested in the films that uh, that, that Breton uh, you know made, or well, it was actually it was Dali and Brunel, but weren't interested in. Um, the, uh, uh, the the literary productions and, and the cultural artistic productions of, of the uh, surrealists they would much rather go see you know film by you know Chaplin so why why so so this is this question of the same kind of disconnect that you'll find discussed in the writings of Walter Benjamin and Theodore Adorno um, and so it's it's a it's a question that Marxist theorists have uh, wrestled with how do you get the intellectuals and the working class on the same page you know we saw in the case of May '68 that the fact that they weren't on the same page was what led to the dissolution of this, uh, this, this uh, short-lived revolution that took place in France in May 68. 
Um, okay, so Derrida's la very last words in his book to his Marxist uh, listeners or auditors, readers, because there were people aud auditing that in terms of being present, but he, he doesn't want us to just think of ourselves as being, you know, audit readers in the sense of just our silent, you know, words inscribed on, on the page, you know, that the, the reader is always already an auditor for uh, Derrida. Um, so his last words to these auditors, readers, who are intellectuals like him, he says, if, if, if he loves justice, like Horatio, if he loves justice, the scholar of the future, the intellectual of tomorrow, should learn to live by learning not how to make conversation with the ghost, but how to talk with him, with her, how to let them speak, or how to give them back speech, even if it is in oneself, in the other, in the other, in oneself, thou art a scholar, speak to it, Horatio. These are the last lines of Spectres of Marx. And so in effect, Derrida is enjoining, you know, he knows that he's not talking to the working class. He's talking to intellectuals in this context, and he's urging them to speak to the, uh, to the specter. And he's going to, I think this is also what he's saying here. We're going to see when we look at his deconstruction of Marx is that he's effectively criticizing Marx for the same reasons that Marcellus criticizes Horatio because Marx um, you know, needs also to learn to speak to specters. And this is, you know, Derrida is going to criticize Marx for chasing away the specters instead of speaking to them. So this, we'll, we'll come back to this in our reading of Derrida's, Derrida's, and our looking at Derrida's reading of Marx, but it's it's the same, the same theme we find that is applied, applicable to Horatio is also for Derrida going to be applicable to Marx. Okay, so now the Marcellus complex then is linked to what he's calling the new international. And so it, what basically, to summarize this, uh, you know, the, the, the context again is remember, uh, the Soviet Union's collapsed, you know, Marxism is in disarray, like in like, let's say Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso has been killed. Um, you know, it's, it's it, throughout the, uh, you know, throughout whether we're talking about Africa or Latin America or the Soviet Union or the Eastern satellite states, there's been this enormous, you know, collapse. So Derrida, when he speaks about this new international that Marcellus is a figure for, he's talking about, you know, people that, that, that are not, you know, that have no, uh, there's no sort of coherent, you know, political organization uh, that, that, that that's currently in place, but that, but there is a kind of a, um, you know, a, a, a friendship or a kinship among those who share similar uh, goals. And this is what he's calling this sort of, he says, well, the old international collapse, now we need a new international, okay, which is not simply a, a rehashing of the old Marxist international, which was, you know, problematic for many different reasons, as he's, as he's going to observe. Okay, so he's going to say, Marcellus was perhaps anticipating the coming one day, one night, several centuries later, of another scholar. And you can think here, maybe Nietzsche or Derrida, because the scholar that Derrida is evoking, it looks a lot like you know, Nietzsche or Derrida. The latter would finally be capable beyond the opposition between presence and non-presence, actuality and inactuality, life and non-life, of thinking the possibility of the specter, the specter as possibility. Better or worse, he would know how to address himself to spirits. This is precisely because he's not an intellectual like Horatio. Uh, Marcellus is someone mad enough to hope to unlock the possibility of such an address. So it's, it's again, it's Marcellus's naivete that is that is an advantage for him. It makes him you know indispensable to the conspiracy, to the revolution. So Derrida says, my subtitle, The New International, refers to a profound transformation projected over a long term of international law, its concepts, and its field of in intervention. For it must be cried out at a time when someone, say like Fukuyama, have the audacity to neo-evangelize in the name of the ideal of a liberal democracy that has finally realized itself as the ideal of human history, that never before have never have violence, inequality, exclusion, famine, and thus economic oppression affected as many human beings in the history of earth and of humanity. Never before in absolute figures have so many men, women, and children been subjugated, starved, or exterminated on earth. And provisionally, but with regret, we must leave aside here the nevertheless indissociable question of what is becoming of so-called animal life, the life and existence of animals in this history. He puts animals in quotes. We saw this in our reading of 
uh, the animal, therefore I am the animal, that, that this is something he's very concerned about. Uh, the new international is not only that which is seeking a new international law through these crimes. It is a link of affinity, suffering, and hope without party, without country, without national community, without common belonging to a class. The new international is given here to what calls to the friendship of an alliance without institution. Okay, now this is also linked to Derrida's deconstruction of the friend-enemy distinction in Schmidt. Uh, which he's, which again Schmidt considers to be a political crime, but is a political crime that Derrida, you know, happily uh, commits. And so w there needs to be a thinking, you know, beyond that kind of friend-enemy distinction. There needs to be a thinking of of, of a new a coalition of, of of those who are interested in transforming the world in ways that that desperately need to be transformed. Okay. Uh, finally, then the Hamlet complex, or this is the matter again, the state of the debt. Derrida is going to say, uh, and this is, you know, a complex issue because it's a matter not just of the maternal debt, but we start asking ourselves what really debt is. How do you get in debt? How do you get out of debt? Why, why is there debt in the world? It's linked to the question of interest as well. So he's going to say an inheritance is never gathered together. It is never one with itself. It's presumed unity, if there is one, can consist only in the injunction to reaffirm by choosing. Uh, one must means one must filter, sift, criticize. One must sort out several different possibilities that inhabit the same injunction. Okay, or as, as I say here, a shorter way of saying this is that one must go through the ordeal of undecidability. And this is Hamlet's uh, fate: is that he has to choose. He's he's he he's you know he has he's he's inherited something. He's inherited a debt. He's inherited a mess, as we all have. Um, we know the world is in sa sorry shape and we've inherited this world and this is our fate. Our fate is the fate of Hamlet to find a world that is out of joint. And so this means, though, uh, that we have to make choices and we have to choose. Uh, remember, deconstruction for Derrida does not mean one does not choose. One must choose. But but after having gone through what Derrida is called, you know, the ordeal of undecidability. And then, uh, and then coming out on the other side of that, you can't, I mean, for instance, you can't deconstruct everything. You, you, you know, you can only, there are only certain things that you can do. And so you have to make difficult choices. And this sometimes means, um, you know, denying what you really don't want to deny. Okay. And I, I mean, I, this is a, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going rather quickly here, but I mean, for instance, in the gift of death, Derrida is going to describe how, you know, like, like um, he's going to ask the question, he loves cats, right? You know, I love cats myself. But the question is, is how many cats can you have, right? Uh, one cat, two cats, three cats. You know, if you have 20 cats, 30 cats, you're going to be the crazy cat lady. And so at some point, no matter how much you love cats, you have, you know, out of your love of cats, the cat that you have, or maybe two or three cats that you have, you're going to have to deny all these other cats that you wish that you could uh, embrace. And so the same is, is, is true for us, given the sorry state of affairs that we've inherited, is that we have to make, you know, ch hard choices about, you know, what we can do, given the fact that we're temporarily existentially limited. And so we, it's not a matter of not making a choice. We do choose, we go through the ordeal of undecidability, but, but when we choose, uh, then we should, we should affirm uh, wholeheartedly what it is that we choose to say, deconstruct, what we choose to uh, affirm. Okay, so he says, Hamlet curses the destiny that would have destined him to be the man of right. One never inherits without coming to terms with some specter and therefore uh, with more than one specter. That is the originary wrong, the birth wound from which he suffers, from which all of us suffer, a bottomless wound, an irreparable tragedy, the indefinite malediction that marks the history of the law, the history of law, that time is out of joint, okay, which we said, remember in our Heideggerian reading, it's unjust, time is, it's not just what we've inherited, it's not fair, it's not right, but this is what we got. This is, um, this is what we're confronted with at this particular juncture in history, and so we have to make decisions about what we're going to do with that, and Hamlet is the figure of that person who makes uh, those uh, decisions. And so when Derrida is speaking of his, you know, nobility or his birthright, he doesn't mean it in the sense of affirmation of aristocracy. He means it in the sense of, of what we all inherit by virtue of the fact that, you know, that we're, uh, we come into, uh, and, and we're born at a certain uh, point in time 
which feels that which makes us feel that we're doomed to be you know sort of as hamlet as the man of right he, i'd rather not do all this i'd rather be having fun you know but he's he's doomed to have to correct what needs to be corrected to 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 set things uh, right after this crime that has been committed and and this is all of our situations i think as well uh, but this figure is is an important conspirator uh, as well, the figure who has to address the wrongs and, and, is, and is linked to uh, all of us as well. So th these are the three things of the thing. OK, so now but in relation to the state of the debt, let me let me also you know talk about this in relation to the foreign debt. He's going to say one cannot establish the state of a debt one owes, for example, to Marx and Marxism in this case, as he's doing this reading of Marx, as one would a balance sheet or an exhaustive record in a static and statistical manner, i.e. in ways that cannot be Cal that can be calculated. It's, it's not a matter of calculation. These accounts, these debts cannot be tabulated. One makes oneself accountable by an engagement that selects, interprets, and orients. Secondly, there is another debt, the foreign debt, okay? And this must be treated head on in a responsible, consistent, and systematic manner as possible. We are pointing, he says, to the interest, question of compound interest, the interest on your student loan debt, you know, how, how fair is that? What do they get going now? Seven, eight percent. What, what's the going rate? You know, I mean, think of terms of usury in a biblical sense. Any interest, what is it? Any loan over two or three percent is in the biblical terms is considered to be a uh, sin. Yet we, we live in a world of, of interest. Uh, and first of all, the interest of capital in general. Uh, thirdly, the state of the debt implies a need for a profound and critical re-elaboration of the concepts of the state and of the nation state of national sovereignty and of citizenship. And I would add to this, you know, for instance, the foreign debt, if we think of, you know, the debtor nations in the, uh, you know, in, in the formerly colonized world who those nations that find themselves deep in debt to, uh, to, to the West, although they were, you know, the, uh, they didn't ask to be colonized, you know, but the, now they're, they're in debt. So, you know, should there be debt forgiveness? This is something Thomas Sankara called for. He told, well, he said before a year before he died, he gathered together the members of the African Union said, you know, we should all just agree not to pay back debt, the, this debt, that so-called debt that we owe uh, to, to Europe. And um, he said, if, he said something to the effect of if, if you don't, um, uh, if you're not going to be on the same page with me in, in a year from now, I probably will be dead. And he was right. Uh, he was dead. He was, he was assassinated because this is, this is a thinking that many uh, in, in the West would find profoundly, uh, uh, you know, would make them profoundly uncomfortable. Okay. Um, all right. We're, we're coming to the end of our lecture here. And so our next lecture is going to focus on, um, you know, Derrida's reading of Marx and uh, one question that we're going to reflect upon is this, this sort of this claim out here that Derrida is a postmodern Marxist. Is Derrida even a Marxist? Can we say that? Uh, well, particularly when he says himself, "Je suis pas Marxiste." I am not a Marxist. Um, so why why is he, why why do demagogues I'm asking here like Peterson desperately need Derrida to be Marxist? What is the fear that's driving this ongoing demonization of Derrida and his work, but also the ongoing demonization of Marx. And so I think Derrida is, is right to emphasize the first line of, um, you know, uh, of Marx's uh, uh, Communist Manifesto when Marx says, there is a specter haunting Europe, the specter of communism. And now I think it seems to be that the specter of both Derrida and Marx is uh, haunting the West. And this is maybe why figures like uh, Peterson are so uh, anxious about this.